Hey everybody, welcome to CAF World War II, the show where we talk about World War II, aviation, history, and so much more. World War II is produced by the Commemorative Air Force, the world's largest flying museum. Our mission is to educate, inspire, and honor through flight and living history experiences. The CAF began the Warbird movement more than 65 years ago. And thanks to the support of individuals like you, we continue to grow strong. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And now our host, Steve Buss. Thanks for watching and keep them flying. Good evening and welcome everyone. This is episode number 117 of Warbird Tube. And tonight we get an update on the B-17 Desert Rat Restoration Project. Now, before we get started, if you could do so, if you haven't already done so, please take a second to like, share, or subscribe and follow us. And if you do follow us on YouTube, make sure you click that bell icon and you'll get notifications about new episodes of Warbird Tube when they go live. Now, as you're watching tonight, if you have any questions, just type them in the chat section and uh, we'll try to answer them either during the presentation if we, we can work it in, or we'll make sure we have time at the end before we sign off. Now, joining me from uh, the Desert Rat Restoration Team, Bill Stanzik and Chris Gibson. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Hey, Steve. Good to be hey, here. Steve. Well, as we get, get started tonight, uh, Bill, we'll start with you. How did you get involved with this project and, and how long have you been uh, working on it? Um, I, I got started in uh, February of 2001. Um, I had been kind of following Mike because uh, I had seen an article about him like in 1994-ish, 95-ish. And uh, I saved the article and um, one day I was going through some uh, a pile of stuff, a box of stuff, and I saw the I saw the newspaper with the phone number. So I gave Mike a call and he was still there. Mm -hmm. So uh, a friend of mine, uh, Chuck Geezy and I, we went out to uh, visit him on a, a very chilly day in February. It must've been about like, three degrees outside. We stayed for two hours. I froze to death and the rest is history. I've been, you know, been part of it ever since. Good. How about you, Chris? Um, it probably goes back about at least 25 years. Um, I met Mike at a restaurant. I was sitting there with my family and I had a eighth Air Force hat on and Mike was like right in my eyesight behind my wife and he kept looking over at me and I'm wondering, why is this guy looking at me? Do I know him? <laughs> and uh, he got up, he walked over and uh, introduced himself and uh, asked me, you know, where did I get the 8th Air Force hat from? And uh, I said, well, my dad was a tail gunner on a B-17 in World War II and uh, my dad gave it to me actually. So. Uh, after that, uh, we chatted a little bit, and he gave me his card, and I put it in my wallet. You know, he said, you know, come on out anytime you want, take a look, see if you want to volunteer. And at the time, I was a union carpenter. I was working a lot, had little kids and all that, and I just didn't have time to go out there. So fast forward about, you know, 15 years later, uh, my kids are, you know, out of the house. Uh, my son went into the Marines. My daughter went to Southern Illinois University. So good time uh, to go out there. So that was about 10, 12 years ago. And uh, I've been going out there ever since. So Awesome. Now, and the project itself, itself actually predates both of you. And you, you mentioned Mike, who's the, the owner. Tell us a little bit about uh, Mike's <laughs> drive to, to find his own B-17. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll handle this one because uh, Mike uh, reiterated the story to uh, someone just recently. Um, he uh, was always interested in aircraft and uh, at about mid 80s, he uh, when computers were just getting going, uh, he was at a um, like a, a not, not like a show, but uh, he, he was at a place for a bunch of uh, uh, plane guys were, were gathering and he ran into uh, a guy named Steve Alex who was trying to put this database of uh, aircraft together and he told Steve uh, you know that he was looking for a P-40 Warhawk to uh, purchase and restore and Steve said um, oh I don't know of any P-40s but I know where there's a B-17 and yeah then after that that as they say that was it. 
And Can I add we, a little bit to that? Yeah. Please do. Please do. Um, I think it was actually at an auction. He went there to buy a uh, PT-19 or 22 or whatever it was, primary trainer, and he didn't get it. And uh, I think that's when he ran into that guy, wasn't it, Bill? But, yep. uh, yeah. That had the list of uh, airplanes that are in the United States. So he was actually going to buy a little PT-19. So imagine <laughs> if he would have bought that. <laughs> we... <laughs> We would have had this done and flying by now, so yeah, we wouldn't be here tonight. <laughs> well, even a P forty, we'd have two or three of them done by now. Really? Yeah. yeah. So we're we're looking at a, a photo of the, uh, the 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 nose or the the cockpit section of the airplane. This is this is how he found it uh, up in Maine, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was at uh, a, a junkyard. I can't remember the uh, Bishop's Bishop's junkyard outside of uh, near Bangor, but I can't remember the little town that it was uh, actually right by or right in. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, looks like quite a recovery effort. Oh yeah. yeah. The um, oh. the scrapyard guy's kids uh, went went to it with an axe and a torch and uh, broke up the fuselage into I think it was eight pieces. And just left them lying around. Yeah, Someone they never, <laughs> they never finished the job. So <laughs> lucky for us. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the, the background of the airplane itself before it, it got to this this point in its in its history. Uh, it's actually one of the the oldest B-17s and had quite a storied uh, career in itself. Uh, with little experimental uh, modifications done to it along the line. Yeah, so it's the uh, the the third oldest B-17 that is still um, around. Uh, first is the Swoos, which was a a, a D model, and uh, then um, the the plane that's out in uh, on Fort Island in uh, Hawaii, mm -hmm. uh, commonly known as Swamp Ghost. Uh, that that was one of the early early B-17Es. It came off the line about 150 or so planes before uh, this one. So that makes ours the uh, the third oldest B-17 in existence, and it'll probably once we get it flying, it will be the oldest B-17 flying. Because as far as I know, I don't think they're going to be um, uh, making swoos um, flyable. So when it came off the assembly line, uh, it went right into uh, training command to start with. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then it was assigned to McDill Field and uh, uh, Life Magazine in April of 42. Actually uh, did a photo spread of um, the training unit down there. And uh, we have some pictures from that photo spread showing uh, our plane with the tail number. You could see it on the fin. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, I'm sorry. The, no, no, go ahead. Yeah. The, it was assigned to the 97th Bomb Group. and. The 97th was the first uh, bomb group to go over to uh, England and was the first bomb group to drop bombs in uh, in Europe, so. Yeah. But the airplane did not make that uh, cross-Atlantic trip, did it? No. Yeah, it came off the assembly line without a ball turret in it. Oh, okay. And it wasn't the only one that didn't have a ball turret. Um, there's some pictures uh, the Life magazine pictures that show uh, three of them in formation, and you can see that they don't. None of them have ball turrets in them, and I think the reason was is they were just ramping up production on Spiri ball turrets, and they didn't have enough to go around. So one plane would go off the assembly assembly line with one, one wouldn't. So just so happens that those airplanes. Down at McDill, didn't have a ball turrets in them. Okay. And aside from uh, training crews to go overseas, the uh, airplane itself actually became somewhat of an anomaly as a, as a uh, X108. Is, did I get that right? The designation. Talk a little bit about the the uh, modifications that that went into this, and maybe some of the thoughts uh, behind what uh, what happened to the airplane. Um, 
Well, so um, the, the, a after spending uh, some time as a training aircraft, um, it was uh, designated for the XC-108 program, and the uh, the C-108 um, was the designation for uh, transport and uh, cargo aircraft. They were looking to uh, see how the seven the B-17 could be used. I think uh, Bataan, which was uh, General MacArthur's personal B-17, that was an designated an XC-108. Um, and so this was, I, th I think those were the XC-108A, which was actually the third, the third B-17 converted. And th this was um, uh, designated for cargo and uh, litter patients. And so the uh, the conversion uh, was done at Wright Field by uh, what was the name? Um, Fairfield. Fairfield. Fairfield Air Services um, uh, between uh, 43 and 44, where um, and and. Chris could probably talk more about what the modifications were that they made to it, but they made the modifications and then um, sent it overseas uh, to uh, uh, the uh, the Asian um, theater, uh, China, Burma, India, where it was uh, used as a, a litter carrier, but it wasn't um, uh, it wasn't successful. Um, I had heard a story about the fact that uh, the engines were right cyclones and most of the transports over there were using Pratt & Whitney engines. Uh, I don't know how true that could possibly be, but uh, um, I know that uh, trying to get over there, they had uh, uh, problems with the number, I think it was the number four engine uh, starting on fire and, and, and things like that. So they did have they did have issues with the aircraft getting it over there. And Chris, what about, what about those modifications? We were talking before we went on air, and, and knowing the ins, inside of B-17s, they took a lot of liberties with with uh, structures to uh, change it into a transport. Yes, they did. Um, they took out uh, bulkhead, well, not the whole thing, but bulkhead six itself, and uh, put a floor in from uh, the rear, uh, entrance door all the way up to bulkhead five which is the back side of the bomb area um they took the um the bomb racks itself out of there and they put a floor in the bomb bay itself which was a pretty stout um uh, structure that they put in there because boeing had a warning that said do not fly the uh, b-17 without the bomb racks in place so you know when they took those uh, bomb racks out they had to really uh, strengthen that whole bomb bay area uh, for that reason so that was basically you know the putting in one floor all the way through was uh, basically what they did so everything was on one level when Mike recovered the airplane, was any of that floor structure still in the airplane? Or does any of it exist? Oh, yes. Yeah. We had to take all that out. Oh, okay. Well, well that, Chris forgot to say, they also cut a big cargo door on the... Uh, on oh, the, yeah, the cargo door. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, it was the biggest cargo door that they uh, they put on, on a B-17. Because uh, they actually did... Um, after the war when they were using them for especially down in like bolivia you know south america and all that they used them as meat haulers so yeah. you know they would take the b-17s and put a cargo door in them but nothing as big as what they had on on the xc-108 so wow. yeah we had to replace all that structure yeah. on that side with new structure because that's right where one of the waste windows were so we had to rebuild that whole uh, left side of the airplane. So as we're looking at the uh, the pictures, the uh, the condition of the the aircraft when when Mike recovered it, um, yeah, as you said, they pretty much chopped it into into pieces. But uh, for the most part, everything looks to be there. I mean, all the main components were there, just not in very good shape. Yeah, um, they uh, they were you know other than having the thing chopped up in uh, you know eight foot sections. Uh, you know, basically the whole airplane was there, um, uh, except for, you know, internal stuff um, and no engines or anything. Yeah. But the wings were there, you know, tail feathers, fuselage. Uh, the nose was actually, I don't know, about 100 yards away from where everything else was. 
they couldn't find it when they first got there. And uh, they were afraid that, you know, the nose was already scrapped. So, but they finally found the thing because in this picture that you see here, you can see, you know, a forest grew up around this airplane. So you couldn't see more than, you know, 100 feet away from it. Wow. Must have been a, a pretty intense uh, workout to get that airplane. Just looking at the trees, <laughs> that must have had to be moved just to just to get that wing section out. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they had to cut a lot of trees down. Okay. They had to make a path into there also. So. Wow. And then we get to load it up and, and bring it back to Illinois. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they used a uh, mobile home um, frame. Okay. Um, and they actually added 15 feet on the back of it <laughs> to get everything on there. And they were probably overweight <laughs> <laughs> when they did that. So they got stopped quite a few times on the way home from Maine. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, just, just looking at it, I, I can imagine the uh, local authorities just wanting to pull them over and say, what is this? <laughs> yeah, exactly. How many trips did it take to get all the pieces back? Well, Mike had the wings uh, shipped because okay. they because of their size, so he had to get a professional to move them. Um, and I, I, I honestly don't know. I, I can't remember if it was two trips or three. Um, well, this picture here, that I think was the first trip. Okay. They had the fuselage in the nose, yep. and then that one before this one was, I think, the second trip. Um. And then the wings were another trip, and so it was at least three or four, yeah. most likely, because I'm not sure of the number either. Yeah. So. But this is my favorite picture. Can you imagine going down the highway and seeing this pass you? <laughs> <laughs> but, Dad, it just followed me home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, originally at uh, Galt Airport is where, the, was where Mike and uh, started the uh, restoration, correct? Yes. Yeah, Galt, Galt Airport is up uh, in uh, northern Illinois, and uh, that's where he was. Uh, uh, he was living in uh, was it Crystal Lake at the time, Chris? Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, Crystal Lake. Yeah. So, uh, um, so he, he was he was fairly close to Galt at that time, but uh, uh, eventually, uh, eventually it got expensive to uh, to keep all the stuff there and. Uh, he wound up um, uh, buying some property in Marengo and putting up a pole barn and, uh, and then moving all the stuff to it. Right. Yeah. So you have a dedicated uh, workspace now. Yes. Oh yeah. And are, are all the components under undercover now, or is there still some stuff that's outside? Um. Yeah. Everything's under is in the barn. There's okay. nothing outside. So. All the B-17 stuff is inside, yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's one yeah, of my so other you're... favorite pictures. That's a wingtip. Yeah. Hey, Steve, let's play a game. How, how, how much do you think that wingtip weighs? <laughs> um, I, not very much. I, I would think not with uh, all the aluminum that's on there. I don't know. What's the weight? 45 pounds. <laughs> Only Bill would know that. I, I didn't even know that. So, <laughs> don't ask me how many rivets are in it. I don't know. Oh yeah, that was going to be the next question. How many rivets in it? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> and this, uh, your, your nose cone that uh, for the glass was this? Was any of this original, or was this all uh, re redone? So this this particular nose cone came off a of Bore 8 bomber, uh, oh. Mike. Uh, I don't remember if he bought or traded something for it, but he want, so this was uh, uh, this was all painted orange at uh, at one point. Um, uh, and it was actually missing that center uh, brace right there. Right, the one at twelve o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. For some oh. reason, I don't, know, I don't know where they got the nose from, but that center section wasn't on there, and there was one piece glass. And when the B-17s early in the war were in the Pacific, they did modifications where they put twin 50s out the nose right in that area. In the original glass, you can actually see whoever made 
the glass for that had a flat spot where you could put a couple of 50s out the front. So I'm guessing that, I mean, this is just a guess, but this nose could have came from a plane that was in the South Pacific. Okay. Awesome. Then I've just got some pictures here of just the general uh, metal work that's uh, been going on through uh, through the years. Yeah, this is uh, the bulkhead four wing attachment. Okay. Um, uh, Chris spent a lot of time uh, making making the channels and uh, and uh, fixing that up. Yeah, if you look at that piece, it's got you'll see like a U channel in there. You can't really see it, but you can see there's two sections to it. That's a that's a big U channel like this. Mm. And our originals, uh, not all of them, but um, at least two or three, uh, we had to remake those. And we made some for uh, a couple other airplanes. So, okay. and, and And that's the... I guess two questions here. Uh, how much of original structure you've been able to keep and reuse, judging by the by the condition that it was recovered in? Probably not a lot, but uh, as you mentioned, you you had to remanufacture these, and as long as you're doing one, you can do another set for 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 uh, other B-17s. Have Have you been trading back and forth with other uh, B-17 operators when it's parts that you need or parts that they need? Oh yeah. Yeah, we're always trading and, you know, doing work for somebody else and somebody's doing work for us. So, you know, it's uh, it's good to know there's other airplanes that can, you know, use parts that you're doing. Uh, it's not, It doesn't always work that way, but we try and, you know, work with other planes as much as we can. So. Sure. Yep. All right. This, yeah, that's the... Um... The leading edge to the horizontal stabilizer, one of the horizontals. Mm -hmm. That's bulkhead seven. So um, this was prior to uh, melding two more pieces together to help with the fuselage. The uh, the tail wheel attaches to uh, that structure there. Okay. Yeah, if you look just to the right, you can kind of see the entrance door into the rear fuselage there oh yeah right right in the corner here yeah yeah okay all right is the uh is the fuselage itself pretty much in in one piece now yes yes okay yeah so you've worked that on through yep now we have a, a little little visual aid here right right bill no. yeah yeah <laughs> so some people say, how, you know, how do you do, how do you do some of this stuff? And uh, this is a, uh, this is actually off of a B29. This is a fuel tank switch, but it's the same sort of flip gauge that the B17Gs had for their um, fuel tanks. And we had one that was missing this little knob. And so, uh, piece of paper, pencil, and calipers, and about uh, a week later, you get this drawing as to uh, what what this knob looks like. So that's. I just wanted to show that um, uh, you, you know we take the time and the effort to try to make things you know exactly how they were before. Uh, if Boeing doesn't provide the drawing, it, or if because uh, in this case this is actually made by a, a contractor, right? So this is bought. This is either government furnished equipment or uh, or purchased to a, a different contractor. Um, a lot of times. Contractors like A and O Smith, A and O Smith, the water heater people, they right. actually built landing gear for Boeing, um, and um, their drawings were destroyed in a fire uh, in the mid '80s. So, uh, so their their particular drawings are gone, but they were basically just, you know, they were copies of the Boeing drawings. So. Right. Well, and, and as you're you're putting these these pieces back together and, and going back to the original drawings and things, how involved has the uh, FAA been in I guess just monitoring progress. Do they? Do you have them come in and do regular sort of? Here's what we've been doing so far, so something doesn't get too far off. No. Um, Mike, yeah. Mike used to do that all the time until they base the FAA basically told them, you know, wait till you have something a lot closer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, 
So in in that case, you know, you, you got to keep you got to keep your records, you know, for your right. material certifications, your heat treat certifications, um, you know, the 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 the, the lot numbers on uh, uh, on rivets, things like that. So if the FAA comes in and says, I want to see the paperwork on this particular rivet, you have you you can show you them all. Right. Well, and that's one of the one of the things with the restoration too is is we look at you know the structure, the the metal work, you know whatever all fabric covering, those sorts of things. But there's a, a whole nother section of work that needs to be done. And as you've just mentioned, it's keeping track of all the records, all the parts that are that are going into an airplane, whether it's a B-17 or, or a Piper Cub, it doesn't matter. You still have to have those records. Right. So who does, who does, who does the record keeping fall to? Is there someone on your team that's uh, <laughs> the person in charge? Um, I have some, Mike has some. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it depends. It depends on who, who procures the parts. If, okay. If, you know. Nice. All right. This looks uh, suspiciously like a cockpit. Yes. Yep. That's uh, cockpit left hand side. So. Yeah. And then the upper the windows. Yep. Yes. Good. And the By the way, what's what's uh what's this wing that we're looking at up up through the. Uh, up through the top of the fuselage. That's actually a quarter scale Sopwith pup. Okay. <laughs> it's an RC airplane, actually. <laughs> oh, it's got a wingspan of about, um, I don't know, 10 feet, I think. Okay. That's eight or close. 10 feet? No. Eight. Eight. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's Mike. Um, Here's Mike. Yeah. <laughs> he's looking. He's looking at us through the firewall of nacelle number three. Okay. So, yeah. um, Mike and he Chris had happy. removed the nacelles from the wings from that wing, mm -hmm. uh, and they did a full rebuild of this particular nacelle because it had been torched and uh, and damaged. So that I know Chris could tell you a lot about the long durands and how to how to repair the long durands on that one because it took a while. Yeah, it's, uh, if you look just to the left, you'll see those U channels. You can see the end of it, one of them right there. Right here? That's yep. the structure because um, nacelle two and three are the nacelles that the landing gear goes up into. So you got this big opening on that one side for the landing gear to come up into. And uh, the one U channel, they actually uh, chop through it. And we got another uh, another airplane made some of these, and we got one of the U channels from them. But we looked at it, and it just it wasn't the best uh, manufactured piece that I've seen. Uh, I'm not going to say who it was, but um, um, I decided I'm just going to fix the one that we had. So I cut the section out that was bad. I fabricated a new U-channel, and then I put a one-piece U-channel on the outside of it and to uh, hold everything together. And you really can't even tell that it was, um, you know, broke mm -hmm. because the way I did it, um, it's hard to explain, but there was another piece that went on there, and nobody would really know that it's a repair piece. So Yeah. Good. So I might notice a bunch of extra rivets, but uh, yeah, I mean there's a bunch more rivets. They knew where they were looking. Yeah, yeah. but the whole to... the whole nacelle. I mean, I took the whole thing apart. Um, all the skins were off of it. Um, I cleaned and epoxied all the uh, the ribs in it, and the longerons and any tabs and brackets and all that stuff. So uh, it pretty much was rebuilt from the ground up. Well, I'm going to jump forward here a couple. There it is. Oh, yeah. It's the de-icer, prop de-icer yeah. thing. Now, that is something you don't normally see on uh, B-17s because it's under the floor of the radio compartment. You can kind of see the, the floor there. But uh, yep. not a lot of work that went into something that you won't really see. I, it wasn't uh, <laughs> wasn't a whole lot of work. Um, this tank actually came from um, Don Brooks. Who owns um, Liberty Bell? Mm -hmm. uh, 
it actually came out of the what was it a G model bill that was in the lake up in Canada? Yeah, up at Dyke Lake. Yeah. Yeah. So it actually came out of that airplane because we didn't have one. So mm -hmm. we got this one from them. It had some holes in it um, that corroded through. We had the whole thing welded back up, all the holes and everything, and we bead blasted it and you know shot it with some uh, yellow zinc chromate. Mm -hmm. And I made all the brackets and stuff for it, and uh, the filler neck we actually <laughs> had to make because was, that was all that was because it was steel. Yeah, yeah, the steel was all you know mm -hmm. corroded away. Um, so we got well, you know luckily the cap, on that, the cap <laughs> on that thing was the same as a radiator cap to what was it a Cadillac? <laughs> no, it's actually that the cap that's on there. Uh, you can get those from aircraft spruce, believe it oh, or not. Really? Same exact. I mean, they're basically no different than how they made them back in World War II. What airplanes use those today? Yep. No idea. Oh, okay. I <laughs> don't have any idea. <laughs> but you can still get them. <laughs> you can still get them. Yeah. You, got, yeah. you got to love aircraft spruce. They've got it all. Yeah. And then switching over to the other side of the radio compartment, you've got the... Uh, some of the oxygen bottles that are under there, and then uh, camera bay as well. I, again, you know, things that folks don't normally see because the, usually the floors are down. Right. That's actually the that oxygen bottle is behind the uh, de icer tank. Mm -hmm. So that's actually the same side as the oh, de icer okay. tank right okay. there. Um, that's the right side. We're actually looking back. Okay. Um, and yeah, all that structure in there, uh, that was gone. Um, and I had to fabricate that whole, that whole thing inside there had to be made. So, yeah, the car, they, they, when they put the cargo floor in, the floor was actually lower, wasn't it, Chris? Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. floor was, I don't know, maybe six or eight inches lower right. than what this floor is. So. Yeah. So, yeah. So that entire, that entire section had to be basically rebuilt. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Well, right now, guys, we're going to uh, take a look at, at some of the other projects that you have going in the hangar. Of course, uh, hangars are notorious for not having great uh, Wi-Fi, but uh, Bill, you, you took your camera out and did some uh, recording. So we're going to take a look at uh, a few of the things that uh, have been going on and uh, some real-time, almost real-time updates on, on where the airplane is. All right. All right. Stand by. All right. All right, we're heading into our workshop area. And this is our warm room with all of uh, the various things that we're working on. This is Chris Gibson. Chris is our resident uh, expert on just about everything. And uh, Chris, what do, you, uh, what do you have there in front of you? Uh, these are the doors for the B-17. Uh, there's four of them, um, starting from the front. Um, this is for bulkhead four, coming out of the cockpit, going into the Bombay area. And then once you go through the Bombay, you go into the radio room, which this is the next door for that. And then once you're in the radio room and you go into the rear fuselage, this is a rear door going out of the radio room. So we just got these uh, from Hangar 13, which is another B-17 that uh, they were building these doors and asked if we wanted some. So they built these for us. And this is the last door. Uh, before you go into the tail gun section, uh, this is the door for that, and it's on uh, bulkhead 9, and it actually sits like this in the doorway, because the bottom of your ribs are curved, so, and then on the top there's a piece that covers that whole thing. There's an opening where the rib is, so those are the last of the doors. So we uh, we got them bare, and I had to finish the the doors with um, spar urethane. Um, the specs call for two coats of clear lacquer, 
we wanted something a little more durable and so we put two coats of spar urethane and sanded them in between and then uh, to finish for a clear we used uh, polyurethane clear on it because it dries a little faster and it's a little tougher so they're pretty much done uh, a couple more little things to do on them and uh, these are the lock sets for these three doors here um, that's what the lock itself looks like this is actually what the outside cover with the handle and everything that uh, goes in this slot right here so that's the lock set for that and then for the, this door it's just a simple slide that goes on on this door here that's the whole setup there for that door so, that's the doors and how do you how do you know that uh our B-17 had the wooden doors? Um, well, it's in the blueprints. Um, and that's where they got the information to actually build these doors was in the, uh, in the blueprints themselves. And this is the original of this piece. It goes over the, the rear door. And you can see it's pretty... <laughs> it's pretty bad, so we made a new one, and uh, so. All right. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. All right, and here we have Mike again. He's going to talk a little bit about the instrument panel. Mike, take it away. This is uh, the instrument panel that's going to go in uh, the B-17E uh, 412595, affectionately called Desert Rat. Uh, this instrument panel uh, came with the airplane, but the uh, face plates had been modified. So we had sent this to the Boeing management uh, some years back uh, to Glenn Spieth, headed it, uh, and used it to copy the instrument panel for the Boeing B. And so they made us new plates and new uh, tags. And so the probably the biggest unique thing about an E over the later ones is the fuel gauge. This fuel style is the later airplanes. B-17E is unique in having three separate gauges. Uh, so it's uh, a little bit different. But uh, we were very happy with uh, what they did and uh, look forward to getting it installed in the airplane soon. Thanks, Mike. So John had a good idea about uh, showing off the tires. These are 56 inch tires uh, for the B-17. These are the, the uh, iconic diamond tread tires here. These came off of a farm in Kansas. Um, a farmer uh, had them attached to a trailer, and after so many years, I guess the trailer fell apart. He took the wheels off, and someone spotted them leaning up against the barn. Um, he had them up for sale, so uh, I purchased them. A friend of mine ran out there and uh, picked them up and brought them back to us. Uh, obviously, the tires aren't uh, usable. They're all rotted out, but... Um, the, uh, the rims are the early style uh, beaded rims that the 17s had, as opposed to the uh, bolt together rims that the B29 and uh, C97 had. Uh, as you can see, uh, we have uh, you know these two these two tires. We got two more wheels behind it, and then up on the uh, up on the case here, up at the very top, are brand new tires uh, that uh, were made. By the B-17 co-op. I guess they're probably about seven or eight years old now, but um, at the time they were expensive. Now they're even a lot more expensive to, to purchase, so it's probably a good thing we got them when we did. And uh, But anyway, yeah, 50, 56 inches over, uh, uh, over four feet in diameter, and uh, really impressive that a 40,000-pound uh, aircraft just sits on these two things. Cool. And then I see one other thing down at your feet look like uh, the carburetors? carburetors yeah 
Yeah, these are, um, my understanding is that they're not to the 1820s. These are to uh, some smaller print ladies. Uh, not exactly sure what, what models they are, but uh, uh, you know, you collect a bunch of things over the years and uh, you hope that you find somebody who, who might need them. So if you recognize any of these and, and could actually use one, let us know. We'd be more than happy to help you out. Here's Chris again. He's here to talk about the tail gun enclosure. All right, this is the tail gun compartment for the B-17. It's called a Stinger. Uh, the early E's and F's and some of the G's had this tail gun. Uh, later on, they changed it to what they call a Cheyenne because it was taken to the Cheyenne Modification Center. They actually cut off that back half of this thing and they riveted on a new piece that had a little bigger uh, end to it, had a bigger glass front and supposedly had more room to move your guns and see out a little better. So, but this one we got and it's pretty much, it's almost done. We have a few more things to do on it, but overall it's about 90% done. And, uh, you know, it has plexiglass in these areas. It actually has a window on the other side that you can actually slide open when you're inside there. Um, it's got bullet, bulletproof glass. That's about three inches thick. It goes in this area here. And there's actually a piece of armor that goes up above here also, just a small piece. And inside there's a big three-piece armor section that goes right in front of you that's right behind the guns itself. Um, the guns we have, of course, they're dummies, but the, uh, the uh, cooling tubes for them are real. Um, but, you know, it's just pipe inside. I think it's a uh, one inch pipe, so it looks like barrels. And we fabricated uh, the stabilizers for them. Uh, people seem to think that those are flash suppressors, and yes, they kind of are, but they're really made to balance the gun itself. They're made out of steel, and because the weight of the back of the gun itself makes it heavy. So they put these on the end of them to lighten up the action of the guns. So that's what those are. Um, in the tail itself, it has two lights here, uh, and I believe they're formation lights that pilots can see from uh, any airplane that's behind them can see the lights, and they use them for different purposes. Um, I think we have the only actually operating gun sight for a tail gun turret of all the planes that are out there. And you can see when you move the guns, the sight moves with it. And again, we're probably the only ones that actually have a working sight on the tail gun. Um, most of the skin is new on it. Um, I don't think we have any original skin. Uh, these are original. This structure, this is, um, this is new. Um, this is original up here. Most of the structure inside is new. Um, the ammo boxes were newly made and the earlier airplanes used aluminum um, ammo boxes like this. Uh, later on they actually went to wood because wood was abundant and aluminum was a strategic material so uh, they decided you know why are we using aluminum for these when they're just holding ammo so they changed these to wood later on um, inside um, we do have some original pieces in here the seat itself where the guy sits uh, that's original um, some of the other structure is original, but there is some new also. Um, 
he actually knelt and sat in that area and he had to sit there for who knows how many hours uh, in that position. So it uh, wasn't the most comfortable, but uh, people think it's small in here, but I can actually get inside this thing and actually sit in this area like that. <laughs> so it's not real comfortable, but I do have some room in here. You don't have much room around your head, but they actually had padding all around this thing, so when you get bounced around, you don't knock yourself out. But, you know, if you look at the gun sight there, I'm moving the guns. Again, it's uh, pretty cool. So, t tell, tell us why this is probably your favorite part of the plane. Uh, well, my dad happened to be a tail gunner on a B-17 during World War II. He was in the 351st Bomb Group, 511th Bomb Squadron. Uh, he did six missions and was shot down on his sixth mission, February 22nd of 1944. And he was a, uh, in a prisoner of war camp till the end of the, the war when he got liberated sometime late April of 45. So yeah. that's, that's why I, first of all, love B-17s and did all this work in the tail compartment. So. And I have to say, it uh, did a lot of really good work. There's a lot of good workmanship that went into this. So, Well, I do my best. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Chris, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, a couple of years back, uh, we acquired some link trainers and a bunch of parts. And you can kind of see the boxes and quantity of parts that we have. This was the one link trainer that uh, we got partially working pretty much right out of the box. Call these things the blue boxes. You can see why. They're painted all blue. And we got, we've been working on getting one of these things completely redone. You can see the piles of material here. And this here is our Link Trainer Restoration guy, John Juna. Hey, John. Hello. What you doing over there? We're trying to get uh, this fuselage ready for its final paint coat. So there's a lot of final sanding and cleaning of uh, the fabric where we can paint it. And at the moment I'm just putting some trim on that covers uh, and provides the guides for our access doors into it. And um, it's neat to see it coming together finally. It's been a lot of work. Mind if we take a look inside? Go ahead. It's not all complete inside yet. Um, there's a lot more linkages and controls and then wiring that goes in here, but much of it has been restored already. It's just waiting for the appropriate time to fit it back in there. And it's a pretty amazing device for 1930s technology. Yep. It, it all basically functions on uh, vacuum with a little bit of electrical assist here, but uh, the electrical assist is primarily for instrumentation purposes. Um, but all of the movement and um, the, what I call the, uh, the, uh, the frosting on the cake that tries to, to more accurately simulate flight. It's all performed by vacuum. That's amazing. So this is the, uh, the stand over here that this is going to be attached to, right? Right. Yeah, presently the fuselage is on a dolly just for uh, operation purposes. But this is the stand that it, that it goes on. And on the top of the stand, there's a universal joint, and the fuselage will be mounted on this, fus on, on this universal joint. And all of the movement of the fuselage is done via these vacuum-operated bellows. And when, uh, when the fuselage is on the stand, the, the bellows will be in a more extended position. And if you want 
to bank it to the left. You draw, um, you draw a vacuum on the left bellows and it pulls it down, which then pulls this one back up. And then if you want to shift back the other way, the opposite happens. And then pitch is done the same way with front bellows. So it, it's pretty neat stuff. Yeah. It's amazing that these bellows um, have enough force available to them to not only operate the fuselage, but a you know potentially 200 pound person sitting inside of it. Yeah. And then for turning, um, there's there's a device here which unfortunately. Oh wait, we can go over to this one. We can show it okay. on this one. There's a vacuum operated motor. It's basically a, uh, I've always thought of it as a V10, but there's, <laughs> there's, a, there's a row of five baffles on this side and a row of five baffles on this side. And it's really neat to see it function. But with uh, the control stick, you operate vacuum ports and they will decide whether or not you operate the left bank or the right bank. And these guys will all operate like pistons. And ultimately the pistons are connected to a crankshaft which turns a pulley up here and this pulley drives a belt which is connected to the base and it makes the base rotate in whatever direction you want. Wow. So it, it's really fun to watch it operate. So the, um, the hood and the door are over here. Hood and the of, door. Of the new one. And the then, uh, refurbed one. Yeah, um, the hood is original, it's just been refurbished, um, it's basically, a, it's masked off right now, but it's, it's all wood construction, and a lot of the wood had to be replaced, but um, it all worked out very nicely, the, uh, the door had to be totally rebuilt, because uh, it was in very deteriorated condition, it wasn't salvageable anymore but that's ready to go and it's uh, kind of fun to just piece it together to see what it's ultimately going to be it's you know it's a small reward so you, you think you'll get the first coat of paint on sometime next week maybe within the week we hope to get it on there weather permitting you know we're always looking for the right temperature and the weather's been a little variable yep so far but it's close all right, John. Well, thank you so much. Sure. And I'll get back to work. All right. <laughs>
to get on it. I really did want to get on it, but uh, just there was just not enough time in the day. So we are offering it out there to anybody that would be seriously interested in uh, preserving it. Oh wow! So there's a, a quick little uh, look around the uh, look around the the shop there. Um, one question that, that comes up: Why take on the the project of the uh, link trainer? Oh, why do we take on the link trainer? Um, yeah. There was a, a museum that was going out of uh, business, yeah. and uh, they offered they offered it to us to save them from having to to throw it out. Sure. And so uh, we wound up with uh, basically three link trainers, two and a half link trainers, uh, and a bunch of extra parts. So um, it was just a, a, a project that uh, when John Juna started coming out, um, his his skills just seemed to really fit into that, and he's really taken to uh, the link trainer restoration like a like a duck to water. So. Awesome, awesome. What is what is next? Uh, the, the next big area that you you see uh, that you'll be working on, or that you are working on already? Chris Bombay. Uh, yeah, the Bombay. We we'd like to get that done because uh, we want to get the uh, the fuselage on wheels so we can move it around the shop, and because uh, we want to move from where it is now to another area. And once we get the Bombay done, we can uh, get the structure that's going to hold that center section um, on rollers. So, okay. So not not just to be clear, you're not putting it on the landing gear. You're putting it in, into a cradle that you can then use it to move uh, around the shop, right? Yes. Right. Okay. And yeah. right now, right now, one of the big uh, issues is the um, the uh, the extrusions that we need for the bomb racks. The the early model through the E model. Uh, B-17s had bomb racks that were different from the F and the Gs. Mm. So everybody who says, hey, we got bomb rack material, we'll sell it to you, doesn't yeah. work. Okay. So we're uh, we're uh, currently uh, looking at purchasing, you know, the, this extruded material, but right now uh, lead times on it are approaching 20 to 24 weeks. So. Wow, okay. That might slow the project down a little bit. Yeah, not to mention the cost. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course. Uh, and once you get the uh, once you get the uh, airplane on on a cradle and you can move it around, uh, do you continue working on that? Are you going on through the wings, the engines? What's what will be after that? Uh, probably, I don't know. We've the uh, cockpit is probably going to be the next big thing to work on. Um, a lot of the nose. Um, I mean, there's areas all over. That we've got, you know, we have to finish up. So, um, you know, because sometimes we have to wait for material mm -hmm. or whatever it happens to be. So we'll move on to some other section of the airplane and work on that. But you know, the main thing is the bomb bay right now. Okay. And then it comes after that. You know, it's cockpit, nose, uh, some of the waste. Uh, you know, it's all a bunch of fiddly bits that have to go in. So. Right. It's like any restoration. Once the big pieces are done, then it's it's all the, the fine details that, that go into it that uh, make it a finished airplane. Right. Exactly. Not, not to mention, we still got the electrical system and the hydraulic system and, you know. Yeah, this is this has been a, a long term project and it's, it's certainly not one that's going to be completed in the next six months. Right. I mean, this is this is still uh, probably couple of years away before uh, before it's it's able to to uh, roll out as a as a complete airplane right yeah we keep saying it'll be done on thursday i like so. that <laughs> <laughs> a uh, a truck full of money would go a long way to helping it get done on thursday <laughs> that is true that is always true with every airplane uh, about how many folks are are involved in in the project on a on a regular basis coming out to volunteer uh, I don't know. Eight, eight, eight to twelve. Hard. Okay. Yeah, eight to twelve. De depending uh, on your definition of uh, coming out often. Okay. Uh, we'll say once a month. Something like that. Yeah. Say about twelve. Okay. 
No. Yeah, I mean, we've got yeah probably a dozen people. Um, I'm pretty much there full time now because uh, I'm semi retired, and uh, you know now I can get out there every day, uh, just about. And a lot of the other guys, they're maybe once or twice a week, maybe three times. Uh, Saturday is usually our volunteer day, so. Okay. With this project having gone on so long, and and it might be difficult for you to answer for Mike, but uh, but I would think in your conversations with what what is it that keeps his enthusiasm and optimism and drive going? I mean, this is this is not this has not been an, an easy process, but yet you know we still keep seeing uh, you know progress being made on the airplane and, and some fantastic uh, work that we we saw tonight and we we've seen in other posts and things. Uh, what what keeps him going? Probably uh, everybody that says that he can't do it, <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. um, you know, people always say, yeah, you're never going to finish it, but you know, it's every day is one day closer to it being done. Um, I've been asked that question too. I mean, mm -hmm. why do I work on, on it so much? And I'm like, it's just a passion that you do. Um, you know, like I mentioned before, my dad, Mm -hmm. was a tail gunner on a B-17 during World War II, you know, got shot down. He was a POW, and, you know, I've loved B-17s since, you know, I was a little kid, since the first time I even heard about it. Yeah. And uh, it's just, you know, it's, it's you get obsessed with it, I think. You just, you know, every day you go out there and you try and make a little more progress, and you, know, you just, you want to get it done, so... That's that's what I do anyway. I'm good. You know, it's like how do you eat an elephant? You know, one bite at a yep. time. Exactly. Well, we're just about ready to uh, wrap up. Uh, Bill, any final thoughts before we uh, close out tonight? Uh, no, just um, you, you know, uh, <clears throat> we're in it. We're in this thing for the long haul, and um, I don't see Mike's or Chris's or John or Chris mm -hmm. or or. Um, Ed, any of those guys, I don't see their uh, passion diminishing over time. If anything, it, the, the fire just keeps burning brighter. And uh, I think it's important, just like just like all the other uh, operators of the 17, you know, who are out there to uh, keep a little bit of history going. Um, I think kids are uh, too engrossed in these things these days. They need to uh, um, they need to take a look at what uh, their great grandparents uh, had to go through back then, and and this is one way to to do that. Yeah, Chris, how about you? Um, yeah, I mean, I feel the same way. Um, I wish more young people would get involved in stuff like this because it is, it's history, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, it shouldn't be thrown to the wayside anytime soon. Because, uh, my dad and millions of other fathers did the same thing. You know, they went over there, they did their thing, they came home and, you know, lived their life. So I think they should be remembered, you know, with something like this going on. So as soon as we can get it flying, you know, the happier I'll be. <laughs> there you go. Important words. And if, if people want to keep up with uh, the latest information and the latest pictures and things, your uh, Facebook page is a great, great spot to do that. Um, just look for the Desert Rat on Facebook, and uh, you guys are posting all the time uh, with uh, new uh, pictures and, and things that are happening, and, and uh, of course, always encouraging people to come out and uh, uh, help out, you know, buck a ribbit or two, or, or spend a Saturday uh, just uh, looking around or, or helping polish some of the aluminum or whatever you can do to, to uh, help out this restoration. Yeah, and money. <laughs> <laughs> and that is that as well. <laughs> if everybody... If all our Facebook followers gave us ten dollars each, we you know we'd have a pile of money. So. There you go. Yeah, you've got fifteen thousand followers already, so you're right. You have yeah. a long way on, on uh, being able to to finish up that airplane. Oh yeah. All yeah, right. We, well, gentlemen, thank you again for for joining us and bringing us up to date on the the latest from uh, the Desert Rat. And you know we. We did this about a year ago, and we'll probably check in another year or so to see uh, see what new things have have uh, developed since since our conversation tonight. So uh, we'll we'll look forward to that uh, probably uh, sometime next year. All right. All right. Thanks for having us, Steve.
Yep. And thank you to everyone for, for joining us, hanging out and talking V17s tonight. Don't forget to click that like, subscribe or follow button so we can let you know about our future shows. As always, if you have an idea for a topic you'd like to hear about, you have some feedback or something you'd like us to do, just uh, send Leah Block an email at media at cafhq.org, media at cafhq.org. Thanks again to uh, Bill and Chris for joining us tonight. And until next time, from the Commemorative Air Force, I'm Steve Bush. Have a good night.